Hey everyone, I'm Ian Skura. And I'm Emily Hickmott. And welcome to The Beat. Today's question is, what is The Beat? So The Beat is one of the three new podcasts that The Eighth Man is doing, um, hosted by Emily and I. And each week we're going to be asking a new question or specific questions around a topic, talking to different people in the Quidditch community to explore those questions and topics and try and get some more answers along the way as we learn about different people in the Quidditch community. Yeah, and the best part of this is we want to hear from you, our community. So check out the link in this video or podcast um, link that has a submission form where you can submit questions that you want us to discuss. And today, what we're really going to focus on is just kind of who we are, how we got into Quidditch, but we're going to do it with some questions that we're going to kind of ask to every guest we have moving forward. So, Ian, what's the first question today? Well, our first question is, what would have had to change for you to not end up playing Quidditch? Yeah, so for me, I have a very clear, like, oh, if this has happened, I would not be playing Quidditch. And it's, if I had made the varsity soccer team at Tufts, I probably would not have been able to play Quidditch because I would have been playing soccer. And I can say with like 100% certainty, I would be a lot sadder and my college experience would just be generally not as much fun because who wants to do varsity sports? Um, <laughs> so what about you, Ian? Um, I think there are a couple approaches to this that I could have. Um, one of which... I think the less exciting being if I just didn't go to Middlebury, I don't think I would have played Quidditch or to another school that had a Quidditch team. But uh, I'm going I'm to make it a little more interesting and say that if I had stuck with Ultimate Frisbee um, and continued playing for the Middlebury Ultimate Frisbee team, I would not currently be playing Quidditch. And I think the reason I didn't was just because um, even though Ultimate Frisbee was a lot of fun and I really liked the team, uh, I don't think that the thing like a lot of the skills that I had adapted from other sports leading up to that point translated quite as well and so I I just didn't enjoy it as much until I found Quidditch which I ended up enjoying a lot more yeah for sure so our second question is where has Quidditch taken you that you didn't expect it to Mm, hmm I guess I'll go first this time I would say that Quidditch that's one place. I'm just going to start start off simple and say uh, Texas. I did not ever expect to spend or want to spend as much time in the state of Texas as I now have already playing Quidditch, and that's only been for a few tournaments. But I have grown, grown to love it there. Yeah, I think that is also true for me, but I'm going to switch it up and say, so, like, I didn't play Quidditch when I went to Europe, but... Without Quidditch, I wouldn't have been able to just been like meet like a bunch of really cool people in London, Paris, and Manchester who I stayed with when I visited. Mm. Um, and just I think the fact that you can like basically be like, "Hey, can I stay with you?" to most Quidditch players who are around the world, and they'll be like, "Yeah, of course, have some tea." <laughs> Uh, my first two hosts, Emma and Marie, just like gave me so much tea and it was so great. But yeah, that would probably be where I would say Quidditch has taken me that I didn't expect. Gotcha. Okay. What's your craziest travel story getting to or back from a Quidditch event? Okay. Oh, let me think about this. I think I'm going to not say like necessarily like the most insane in terms of like not having being like I don't have any like mad stories like Leanne or Mike where I like don't make my flight or anything I've always had like pretty blessed luck but I think one of the craziest things that has happened um, is the first year of MLQ we were driving to Ottawa and there was a U.S. soccer game so Julia, Bear, Bo O'Connor, Ethan Sturm, Jake, and I were all in a car driving 
up early to go see the game. And when we were passing through Canada, um, we had like we got stopped at Border Patrol, um, and they were like, "Leave your phones," and it was like really kind of terrifying. And then while we were sitting waiting for them to search our car, Jules was like joking about having bombs, and we were just like, "No, Jules, <laughs> can't joke about that right now." Um, and then we found out later that the reason that they were being so like uptight with border security was there was like a couple of escaped prisoners in like Upper New York. And they were looking for them. So I think oh, wow. that's probably the craziest that I can remember at this point. Uh, what about you? <laughs> um, crazy for a different reason. But uh, last MLQ championships, I was trying to get to Richmond, Virginia, um, obviously. And so on my way down i got to boston totally fine drove down and was flying out of logan airport and i was actually flying with my dad and we uh got on our first flight flew to new york to jfk i believe it was um and we had to switch terminals in order to make our connection for the next flight uh, because we were connecting through new york and uh, the first thing that happened was um they wouldn't let you, there was no way to walk from the terminal we were in to the terminal we had to be in for our next flight. So you had to take this shuttle bus, but the shuttle bus, um, we were literally the last people to miss, or the first people to miss uh, the shuttle bus that we were waiting for. Um, and so we didn't think we were going to make the flight because we were the first person for the next one, but they were taking forever. Um, and we finally got onto the shuttle bus and we found out that it was literally like they drove us about 20 feet to the entrance to the next terminal, but because of the way that security was set up in the airport, you couldn't walk there. Um, so we literally could have run and been fine, but instead we waited for like 20 minutes. Uh, we still somehow make the plane, um, but then uh, there, the runway was backed up so much uh, with different planes that had been delayed because of weather that our crew timed out and they completely canceled our flight after waiting on the flight on the tarmac for over an hour and so uh, we quickly tried to reschedule and found that the next available flights were at 4 p.m the next day so my dad and i decided to get a rental car and drive to richmond from new york and we but the problem was that none of the rental companies would let us do a one-way rental. So we had to drive to Newark Airport. So we got a taxi to Newark Airport from JFK, got a rental car, um, and then had to drive back to JFK to pick up Justin Cole because this had happened to him we didn't know. And then we made it to Richmond at about 5 in the morning. Um, oh, man. So, yeah. That sounds like a lot. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's but okay. you made it. We made it. And you won. <laughs> it was definitely worth it. It would have been worth it even if we didn't win, but it was a crazy trip. Yeah. I, again, I feel like I've been really lucky with all of my trips that I've done, and I'm probably cursing myself for the future, but we'll deal with that in the future. <laughs> um, all right. What are the worst weather conditions that you've ever played Quidditch in? So even though I have played Quidditch in a fair amount of snow, uh, being up in Vermont, uh, the worst weather I've actually played in is Rochester rain, uh, in Rochester, New York. So, um, I forget which particular regionals cause I've played in multiple rainy cold regionals, but one of the Northeast regionals in the time at, that I was at Middlebury that we went, it was like, 35 degrees or something um just warm enough that the precipitation was rain but not cold enough that it would freeze and become snow <laughs> um and so everyone was drenched in rain and just freezing cold on the sidelines but there wasn't like a great place close to the fields to stay dry um or warm up so you're just kind of standing under like a tarp in the rain in like 35 degree weather <laughs> yeah i feel like depending on which regionals it was it might have been the one where i was doing gameplay and we had to switch the fields like yes. six times yeah it was that one and that was absolutely awful i think i lost feeling in my feet 
Mm-hmm. But that's kind of also my own fault because I didn't bring very good like shoes. But man, it was it was awful. What's the worst yeah. conditions you've played in? So, like many people from the Northeast, I think one of my worst experiences was at Ostra, New York. Mm. Um, it was my, I think, the very first um, Hofstra tournament that I went to when I was a freshman. It was rainy and cold, and honestly, I've blocked a lot of it from my memory. But there's this picture of it where we, everyone's just, like, drenched in water, and, like, they're huddling in like a line with like one poncho over three people because that's how cold we were and you just like couldn't feel your hands and it was just like hostra in like (laughs) winter and uh, would not recommend to anyone at any point oh my Um, gosh yeah so cold all the time but i think that's just one of like the curses in the world is that if you have a tournament at Hostra, it's gonna rain in some time at some point. Mm. Good to know. Good to know. Yeah. Um. All right, Emily. What would you be doing if you were not playing Quidditch? All right. So I'm gonna assume this is like sports that I haven't would be doing, um, and I'm gonna say that I'd probably be playing rugby because I think. Of the sports available at Tufts at the time, the rugby team was the other one that I kind of like tangentially hung out with um, because one of my friends was really involved and she always tried to recruit me for rugby and I always tried to recruit her for Quidditch. (laughs) Um, So I think if I wasn't playing Quidditch, I probably would have ended up playing rugby, which probably would have also resulted in many sprained ankles because it's also a very physical sport so what about you um if we're talking sports i think i would either be playing ultimate frisbee still or some form of club slash like pickup soccer um occasionally which i still try to do but yeah i think i think one of those two would probably just be what i what i stuck with yeah so how do you think quidditch has impacted your life in the time you've been playing it Wow. Um, I think Quidditch has ended up impacting my life in a number of ways. I've met a ton of people through it, and I think some of my closest friends, both at school at Middlebury and then starting to branch out just like beyond that in life, uh, are beginning to all be Quidditch people. And I think like you said earlier, it's it's definitely made me feel like there are tons of places that I can just travel and go to because... I could reach out to a Quidditch connection and they'll probably let me like stay on their couch, excluding the time of COVID, but like normally, obviously. And then I guess otherwise, uh, I think Quidditch has definitely like in high school, I was a, I was a three sport athlete and I felt like I was constantly kind of training for whatever the next season was. Um, And so I was constantly like trying to set goals for myself. And I think Quidditch has kind of given me that again. When I graduated high school, I decided I didn't want to play varsity sport um, in college, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I think Quidditch kind of gave me an outlet to be able to set those goals again athletically and kind of keep challenging myself. Yeah. So I think for me, Quidditch has brought me out of my shell a lot. I feel like I'm most, my like the most me, when I'm at like a Quidditch event and around those kinds of like the Quidditch people, I think it's also helped me develop a lot of actual marketable skills just through the different volunteer things that I've done um, with like USQ and MLQ and running random fantasy tournaments. Um, I think it's kind of like helped me figure out a lot about who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's also like, brought into my life so many like absolutely fantastic wonderful interesting people I think that all of the people who I've met through Quidditch have like genuinely been fantastic and I'm really like so happy that I got to be a part of like a community that was so open and welcoming and fun so 
that's kind of the impact Quidditch has had on my life. So. Yeah, I've definitely said this before somewhere, but uh, I think just like the the overall quality of people that you meet through Quidditch, it's hard to explain to anyone who hasn't experienced it before. I don't know. I, I just feel like it's, yeah, it, it allows you to connect with people from all over who just kind of embrace themselves in a way that like a broad community like this doesn't always. Yeah. I think there's definitely something in like the shared community of like being able to run around with a broom between your leg as much as I know some people don't like the broom. You have to have like a certain aspect of your personality where you're like, yeah, I may look like a fool sometimes, but I'm a fool having a whole lot of fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. So who is a player that you want to play with that you haven't gotten to at this point in your career? Mm. Okay. I think, th- I think the two people would be Luke Meisner and Casey Beavers. I think so even though, for example, Luke and I both play keeper, uh, my first year playing like competitive Quidditch with Knight Riders, I almost entirely played wing chaser. Um, yeah, and you were so good at it. And I would really enjoy playing with the two of them just because I, I feel like like having just watched them and they're kind of that dual threat combo that Eighth Man has literally written articles about. Um, the, like... I think, I, I don't know, I would just be really fun to try and fit within that mold and also just to get to play with these people that I've I've heard so much about and gotten to see them play, but I've never actually gotten to play with them myself. What about you? I think it's Lindsay Morella because I've been on a lot of teams like around, like I see Lindsay a lot and I've been at a lot of tournaments with Lindsay, but I haven't actually gotten to play with her <laughs> which makes me sad because she's just so dynamic in like all the different things that she does. And I don't know, I, this kind of comes from back when I was playing with Tufts, but I just loved playing with another lady chaser who is just a baller. And I got to do it a lot with Hannah debates. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it would just be super fun to get to play with Lindsay in like a competitive setting for that. So Yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, the the way that she can just adapt to filling almost any role is absurd. I know. (laughs) Just like her mid-range shot, it's just like chef's kiss. Yeah. (laughs) So good. Uh All right. Um, Okay. Uh, What's the most memorable game that you've ever played in your life? Okay. Uh, I think the one I'm going to choose is when Tufts beat Maryland um, at the final in Oktoberfest just because it was Tufts first win of a tournament in the program's history, which like was really exciting because we'd always gotten really close um, or like we made the finals in world cup four, but we still like hadn't won a tournament for like four years. Mm -hmm. Um, or five at that point and it was just honestly like probably one of my favorite groups of people who were on that specific field at that moment and the fact that we like won it out of range we had a bunch of old alumni at the field supporting us like cheering us on it was just like a really great experience all around so gotcha so I'm actually also going to choose a college game which is I'm almost surprising myself here, but I think the most memorable game I've played in was not this past fall regionals, so not 2019, but 2018 Northeast regionals. Middlebury, we played against um, Macaulay for basically the winner would get a bid to nationals, um, and then the loser would ultimately get another chance to get a bid for nationals, but like we were starting to get really late in the day at this point. And that was my second year playing USQ official with Middlebury. But um, it was, I guess at that point, like sort of my second and a half year playing competitive Quidditch. And it had been 
like eight years since Middlebury had competed on a national level. And so when we qualified and won that game, also the game ended up lasting an hour. And there was, I think we got to like the last niche handicap. And so I think just like the buildup of how long that game was and the fact that we had, we didn't totally know if we were going to be able to qualify for nationals or not that year. I don't know. It just really meant a lot to like our whole team that we were able to kind of bring back the program in some way. Yeah, that's definitely, I think I might have been at that regionals. If it was the really rainy one again, it might've been, but I feel like, I think that was such a cool moment in Quidditch when Middlebury like got to go to nationals again is just fantastic. So um, what is a skill you wish you were better at? Hmm. So I think something I wish I was better at uh, is catching bludgers. Even though I rarely ever play beater, I think I've played for Middlebury in three games. Uh, I I feel comfortable, like even when I would practice and stuff, I feel comfortable dodging bludgers because I think I had to develop that skill from, from chasing and keeping. But catching a bludger is so different from catching a quaffle. Uh, I think it probably has to do with the fact that one is thrown with the intention of you catching it, the other one is not. But it's something that like watching someone who's good at it is, it almost seems second nature. Um, but it's, it's really, it's really difficult. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Anytime I catch a bludger, I'm like, how did this happen? <laughs> yeah. Half the time it how ends up in my hands. I'm like, I, I don't remember this. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what about you? What's a, what's a skill you wish you were better at? I think snitch on pitch beating. Um, just because I don't think I've ever actually done it in like competitive footage, like on an actual game. But like during practices, I always feel like I never quite make the right decision. And I think it's just like you have so many things happening at once that I get very overwhelmed. And like even sometime this year during Bosnia I like just was just like nope I don't want to snitch on pitch beat it's just so much running so many things so much pressure um and I think it's something I definitely need to get better at in the future because it's kind of important most of the time yeah, yeah. that's it's kind of what I'm... I feel like there are a lot of uh, people who are better at it can definitely correct me but I feel like there are a lot of different approaches to it um as with a lot of aspects of the game, but it's, yeah, it's so crucial and such an important part of either securing a win for your team or helping your team to come back. Yeah. And there's so much, like so many things you have to process at once. Yeah. Um, Everything's going a hundred miles an hour. (laughs) Yeah. And like the really great ones, you can see like they know where every single person is on the field when they're snitch on pitch beating, which is awesome. Yeah. All right. So who is a person who has had the largest impact on your Quidditch career? I think I'm going to go with three people because they all kind of had the same together. They all had the same impact. I would say that my brother Ryan kind of was the first person to teach me what Quidditch was because he went to school before me and started playing. Um, And even though he didn't pressure me to play at all, in fact, didn't even really talk about it at all, even when I was going to college. I think watching him just love playing Quidditch and enjoying it for what it was, even if it was totally different than how Quidditch is now, um, definitely had an impact on me. Then my close friend, Andrew Plotch, who I went to Middlebury with, he was actually my orientation leader. Um, And if it weren't for him pressuring me to come to practice all the time, I, I don't know if I would have ultimately tried it out, even though I already knew what it was. I think I'm, I'm mad at myself for this now, but I was, I was trying to explore like other avenues. And I think I was like, I thought Quidditch was a little too like nerdy for me, even though I was already clearly a nerd. And he, like you said before, it's hard to kind of just like embrace how goofy it is. And then the last person is Harry Greenhouse because like my first real like competitive Quidditch was with the Knight Riders, and um, he was the coach the year that I first joined. And I think he really believed in me and, like, talked to me individually. I think he did this to everyone on the team, but, like, he went out of his way to kind of really talk to me and help me 
learn what I needed to get better at. And I think without that encouragement right at the beginning of when I was starting to learn, I don't know how much I would have kept with it, at least to the degree that I have, um, kind of with all those three people, because they all kind of influenced me at, at crucial moments, I think. Yeah, for sure. For me, I think that the first person is definitely Ethan Sturm, um, who my first year on Tufts was also his first year playing for Tufts. He had played before on like the Tom River Hydras. And he was the person who was like super involved. Um, he taught me how to throw um, because when my first year in Quidditch, like the way I threw is if like, you know how you throw a throw in for soccer? Mm -hmm. That was my throwing motion, but with one hand. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. <laughs> and so Ethan has spent like hours with me, just like teaching me how to throw with like actual form and in a way that was like, not just like from your elbow. Um, and then he was also the person who like, if I was in a Quidditch rabbit hole, um, he would always be there to discuss it with me. So if I was like backstocking some of the old Quidditch tumblers, which I used to do a, a lot of, especially the summer I was home after my freshman year. Um, I would just like backstock the golden snitchy and butts and brooms and discuss things with Ethan about them. And he'd be like always willing to talk to me about that. Um, and then he also like helped me start volunteering um, kind of by force with like helping him with mqc and then he was a gameplay coordinator so i was like i want to be a gameplay coordinator mm -hmm. and then just like with building out mlq and now allowing me to be a part of that with him in dallas and the rest of the really cool crew there it's definitely been like an enormous part of my quidditch career mm -hmm. and then the second person is leanne my freshman year, she hosted the first of many, many, many um, Boston fantasy tournaments, uh, the very first annual Jingle Bell tournament at Joe Moakley Park. Um, and I was on her team and she was just like incredibly welcoming and open and like fantastic. And then I had a really good time playing with all those Emerson people. So I signed up for Emerson House League that spring and I was put on the JP Jaguars who Leanne was one of the captains and she was just like also still like really warm and welcoming and like I think together with like all of the fantasy tournaments and just like general social aspects that she brought to the sport helped build such a strong community in Boston because I know like I a lot of the fantasy tournaments that we did were just so good at like getting players to play with people they didn't play with all the time, which like helped us grow as players and then helped us just like grow as a community. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just like getting to be part of Leanne's like hype train and like be a part of her Quidditch community has been like so important to me because she's just like such a warm and welcoming person yeah so she is. i think those two had the biggest impact in like where i went with quidditch so gotcha. yeah awesome i think that wraps up all our questions um yeah and i think in like future podcasts we'll probably have other questions more related to whatever topic we're covering mm -hmm. that exactly. day but these are going to be like general ones that we'll be asking as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I'm excited to learn more about different questions people have, help people answer them, kind of help bridge knowledge, pass it on, learn about stuff and things. What about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm equally excited. Um, I also just hope that this episode was uh, at least a brief way for people to feel like uh, they understand us a little bit and maybe why we're doing this podcast. Um, so that as we keep moving forward, we can, we can explore more questions all together. Yeah. 
and make sure to submit any questions that you have. And don't worry if you think that they aren't complicated enough or not specific. We're going to have a lot of fun with whatever we're given. I know one question I think would be really fun to go over is, how do you be a good coach? How mm -hmm. do you be a good snitch? How do you run a tournament? All of these fun things that we can kind of talk to people about. Um, so. Yeah, I think those are all really interesting questions that, that we can dive super deep into. And yeah, like Emily said, uh, I'm sure there'll be a link to our submission form um, either on Facebook or um, if you're watching this on YouTube in, in the link in the description. So I think there are a number of ways that you can find the link to this form and submit your questions. Thank you for listening to The Beat. We're excited to delve into Quidditch with you.